So hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Today is Friday, July the 30th, and this is episode number 119 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. This is the way to be. So I'm glad you're here. Join us uh, on Facebook if you've got a question that you want to talk about right now and you're looking for a fellowship of friendly beekeepers. It's called The Way to Be. So look up groups, Facebook, The Way to Be. And if you're good and you answer those questions, people are going to let you in. You can share your stuff right then. Someone is looking for permacomb. Permacomb is a plastic pre-drawn cell system for supers for honey gathering. And apparently the company has gone out of business. So some people are looking for permacomb. I don't use it. I did a cursory test of it. I got rid of all of it. But uh, that would be an example of a place where you could go and say, hey, does anybody have this type of thing? So it is, did I already say it's 65 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So we've got a cool down, which is 18 Celsius. And we've had heavy rains. And But the bees aren't flying today, even though... Uh, the conditions are questionable. we got some good stuff going on. So I'm going to jump right into it because we have a lot of ground to cover today. The first question comes from Peter Gunn, Manchester, Tennessee. How much should I feed my bees? I have three hives, 10 frame singles. I have five gallon bucket community feeders and the bees will drink five gallons of sugar syrup a day if I will set out there. I have looked in the hives and they are not honey bound. So I really don't know where it's all going. Thanks for any input you can give. So here's one of the things I want to talk about when it comes to open feeding. And you know I've done it because I do a lot of testing. I like to see what species are around. So I use open feeding stations to do that. Where should your feeding station be? Well away from your apiary, by the way. Don't feed right in your own backyard apiary. Please don't feed directly in front of your hives. Now you can provide water and resources like that close to the hives. But when it comes to feeding and putting out honey and sugar syrup and things like that, 50 to 100 yards at least from your main apiary because we don't want to draw in the bees. So here's the thing. If you're putting out the feed, what I like to know is, how do you know? If your bees are the ones that are at those feeders, how can you tell? I'm going to give you a trick that's kind of fun to do. So now this works more when you put out things like honeycomb or whatever. But if you're putting out sugar syrup and the bees are on a little raft and they pile in there and they're shoulder to shoulder bees and they're coming and going, it's kind of hard to look at them and say, are those my bees or am I feeding the neighborhood? Because once you put that out there, once the scouts find the source and they're after sugar syrup, they'll even abandon flowers and nectar to go after the sugar syrup. I know people have often said, well, if you put sugar syrup on, they're going to ignore it as soon as nature kicks in and the environment starts providing. And that's partially true, especially when you're feeding inside the hive, which is really the only way to guarantee that your bees are the ones getting the resources. Makes sense. Now we put it out there and they're all over it. So I take dry powdered sugar and I really need to do a video of this because it's fun. And when you see the bees are all on there, poof. Douse them all with dry powdered sugar. They comb off their eyes, they do a little clean up, and then they fly away. And now what can you do? You can go back to your beehives and you can look at the landing boards and see where the powdered sugar is landing. And if you don't see any of those bees coming to your hives, it's time to shut down that open feeding. Because what you're doing is John Smith down the road who has bees is getting them fed by your sugar syrup. Why is that bad? Bad partially because you're paying for it. But number two, instead of the nectar from flowers this time of year, which is why I don't feed this time of year unless we're in some kind of terrific dearth period where nothing is going on and the bees are bringing in nothing and we actually need to have them survive. But you're giving sugar syrup to somebody else who may not want it because they're trying to get their honey supers going. So feeding in a dearth period, an absolute dearth, yeah, they can sustain the bees and can save their lives, really. They can. But uh, if there's already resources coming in, the bees seem to be doing okay, and they're still developing brood, and there's lots of eggs, and all the production is going on, I highly recommend not feeding. But do that test, throw powdered sugar on them, 
and see if it's your bees that are benefiting from the feed that you put out there. And I know there's commercial beekeepers that put out five gallon buckets of stuff. So anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is goldenrod. Weird. Goldenrod here in the northeastern United States, the state of Pennsylvania, is actually about to start opening. That seems early to me. We're at the end of July. So if that starts opening, I hope everybody's ready around here for a sudden boom of pollen and nectar, which is going to put your bees into overdrive because they're in a state of rapid increase. We've looked at frames over the past week in the hives, the long Langstroth hive, which everybody's interested in. Uh, out of curiosity, there are thousands of eggs in there, thousands of eggs. So that means full frames. And in the cover picture of this video is going to be the very last question that I answer about the number of cells inside a frame and how that's useful to you. Or not, we'll find out. But thousands of eggs within three days because whole frames are covered in nothing but eggs. So how long does that mean that the queen has been laying if we're still seeing eggs? They have to be three days or less because after that they hatch and then they become a pupa. So a larva, I'm sorry. Pupa is when they're capped. A larva is when they hatch out of the egg and they start being fed by the bees. So the nurse bees. So somebody's in overdrive and that means 21 days from now, thousands of bees a day are going to be added to their numbers. So we will be, of course, into August for that. Let's move on. Tim Foster, next question from Wellborn, Texas. I put my Flow Hive Super on top of my first medium super in the spring. They crawled around it and seemed to start to seal the cells, but never put nectar in it. Any tips on getting them to use it? I did pre-wax it before I put it in. I just took it off as we are in our dearth now and we'll try again next spring. So really in that part of the country, so Texas, you're already done with all your nectar and all your honey potential. So that's it. Because for us here in the Northeastern United States and other parts of the country, I'm sure, our most significant nectar flow is the end of the summer. So I think it's too bad that Texas and things are already wrapping up. So as far as what do I do and why does that not work? And that's a common question because flow hives, flow frames, if you don't put that on a strong colony of bees, they won't expand, especially a new colony, for example. If they're not strong enough, they're not looking for places to store their extra nectar. They just keep building up. So part of my question would be, what's the condition of that medium super? Is it full? And again, for the brood box, is that full? Because if it is, then it shows that they were full, they were looking for places to store stuff, and then actively ignored working in those plastic flow frames. So that's one part of the question. The next thing I'd like to ask is, is there a queen excluder in there? And I know that when you put on a flow super or any other kind of super, you're supposed to put a queen excluder in there, but you also know that Sometimes the queen excluder can slow down the progress of the bees into certain areas. And when it comes to those plastic queen excluders, it's been my experience that especially with flow supers, they start to glue up with propolis and wax, the little openings, and they start really limiting that. And then they actually consider that like the ceiling of the interior space available in the hive and don't even go into the flow super. So what my suggestion is, and I have to say this, it is against the recommendations of those who invented the flow hive. Their recommendations are brood box, queen excluder, flow super. What I do, and again, you, know, you take a risk of your bees laying eggs. The queen may lay eggs up in the flow super, but this is what I do and what I recommend now. Brood box, let it get full. Honey super, let that get full. If that honey super fills up really fast and there's brood and honey in it, I add another medium super on top of that, let them fill that with honey, and then I put on the flow super if they get that far. If they never fill those bottom boxes and they never establish that solid grouping of honey, um, then you may not be able to put your flow super on. Some parts of the country, the nectar flow is so brief and so short that the bees don't put on enough resources like that. But without the queen excluder, I found that the bees more readily go into your flow super, use those frames, get them all prepped, get them started. And then once they're in that, if you have to use a queen excluder, I recommend that you put it on after that and verify, of course, that your queen is down below and have no upper entrance. 
Because if something happens and they supersede the queen and she flies out, does a mating flight, and comes back and tries to get in, she could get in through your upper entrance and then be above your queen excluder and start laying in your flow frames. So, but I never have waxed it. I've never spritzed it with sugar syrup to see if that would accelerate things. And others do that, I know, and they say that that works for them. It's no question that bees, if there's beeswax on something, they're inclined to think that that's for them and they could use it. But I have found that a strong colony with a large population that's already built their wintering resources and meaningful progress is being made inside the hive. I found they expand into any available space. Even if it's just, you know, if you put an empty box on there, they would start to build comb in it. So if they're in active comb production, they are going to build up in your flow super. I'm going to show you something. If you pull an inner cover off of your beehive, and it looks like this, look at all that wax. If those bees have built all of that burr comb in the space above your top box and under your inner cover, that colony is ready for a flow hop. They're in overdrive. So highly productive bees make use of all available space, no matter what kind of space it is. So that's my recommendation. Maybe start, take the risk, maybe start without a queen excluder and go from there and see how it happens. Question number three. This is Barry from Oakland, California. My dumb luck, I have had an uninterrupted lineage of honeybees for a very long time. Started with two Italian hives from Oliverez Honeybees in Chico, California about 15 years ago at least. Once several years ago, I shut one hive down for bad behavior. I've never kept more than two hives, small time stuff. And almost every year I have had two hives. Tried requeening through the mail once because I thought I should. Because of the then new to us AHB scare. AHB is Africanized honeybees, hybridized bees that are super defensive. So I tried requeening through the mail and keeping gentle bees by keeping known genetics, but I failed. I'm not nearly as skilled at their survival as they are, certainly. But I was at one hive this year, and instead of splitting amongst themselves, I ordered a VSH, Italian VSH. Varroa sensitive hygienic. So that means they're sensitive to Varroa, they get rid of them, they're hygienic, they remove infected cells of capped pupa, for example, and uh, they will, if there's, if there's dead larvae, they'll remove them, they'll also chew the caps and pull out cells and the larva, the pupa inside that have Varroa destructor mites with them. So anyway, sorry I messed that up as far as an explanation kind of all over the chart. Anyway, to start the second hive. For once, I'm apparently succeeding. Well, they are so far by accepting her. So after lots of blah, blah, here are my questions. Do you think feral survivor stock might just be able to withstand higher mite loads than the innately keeping them low with rare mutations like the VSH? and mite biting. So by mite biting, maybe the Purdue ankle biters, if you want to know more, look up those. They chew the feet. It's been my experience that bee weaver bees also chew the feet on the Varroa destructor mites. Second question, I am now starting to remove a good selective pressure for resistance by treating with OA. I'm struggling with this big time after. Okay, so there's something I want to kind of direct people to and I missed it. I was invited to listen to a presentation by Dr. Thomas Seeley about Darwinian beekeeping. And this kind of sounds like a, a comparison of that. Can we meaningfully, as backyard beekeepers, can we actually genetically alter our own stock, local survivor stock, and can we meaningfully rear predictable queens with predictable traits and qualities and things like that? The general consensus, of course, is no, you can't, unless you have hundreds of hives and you can successfully isolate yourself and you have these queen mating yards and you have these drone yards where you put those genetics out there and you actually have enough to do it. We really can't get into genetic modifications in queen breeding on a meaningful and predictable level. But what we can do, as described here, um, you can work with local genetics and you can, of course, work from your own stock, which I did this year. So other than bringing in one Saskatraz package, uh, two out of three died. Anyway, 
One Saskatraz package got put into my horizontal long laying Stroth hive and they superseded the queen because I just marked her a few days ago, the new queen. So they've got a new queen. So once again, we're in local genetic stock. And so my overall plan to help reduce what requires treatment is we're counting Varroa. We'll talk about that a little more today. But uh, what you can do is use locally adapted bees. So how do you do that? You're really dependent upon what's going on around you, the other beekeepers in your area, the stock that they're keeping, and the drones that they're sending out into the drone congregation areas, because what's going to happen? You're going to split your stock. I like to do walk-away splits. That's basically all I do when I'm making new queens, although this year I did find queen cells, transferred those into other queenless colonies, let those queen cells hatch. I had nurse bees and other larvae and stuff like that in there, and that worked very well this year, but once a queen hatches, she introduces unknown genetics because she's going to fly. And maximum, I get in a pickle on this because I say things like, the queen, when she does her mating flights, can go as far as nine miles. Well, that's a maximum ever recorded from studied apiaries and queen bees. So they could prove that she made it nine miles. Does that mean queens are going nine miles? Not normally. They're much closer usually. So two to three miles maybe. One mile maybe. Wherever she finds a drone congregation area and she's releasing that fertility pheromone, which says she's open and receptive to mating, those drones that are not related to her will zip up on that pheromone stream and they're gonna mate with her. So now, depending on those drones and what's going on in your area, this is why, for me, when is the best time to be making new queens that way? Setting up your colony, pulling frames of eggs, for example, with nurse bees on them and creating a nucleus colony that has no queen and letting them choose from those eggs and produce queen cells. And then as they grow, the queen of course hatches when? Within 15 days. We're gonna talk about that a little bit too down the line, but then she's gonna hatch out and she's going to mature and then she's gonna fly off and do her mating flights. And now we have unknown stock but the time to do that for me is late spring when there's an abundance of resources. When you're looking in the hive and every little larva is in its own little soup of food. In other words, when you look in there and we get all excited, look, there's eggs. And then the egg hatches. Look, there's little C-shaped larvae. And they're so good looking. They're pearly white and they're so healthy. But how much food is in there with them? Are they sitting in a soup or do they look kind of shiny and healthy but somewhat dry? So when they're sitting in the soup and there's a pile of food and resources in there, that says that that's the time we want to have them raising new queens because that queen is going to be fortified with the best possible diet that they're getting from the environment, not being fed from ultra B dry pollen sub or being fed with sugar syrup and things like that. This is when a nectar flow is on, pollen and nectar coming from the environment, a variety of resources, diversity is key. That's going to make the best queens and then they're gonna fly out, and then we have to see how they make it. But they are adapted then to your climate, we hope. See, again, because who else has their drones out there? Who's mating? Maybe we could luck out and it's a feral colony that has all the traits that we're looking for. We cannot predict it. All we can do is observe it, and when we have it, when we find a queen that does the things that we like, and we have a colony that is low on mites, and survives winter, survives your environment, and raises effective foragers that do great things and that they do everything perfectly, those are our breeder colonies. That's how I picked mine that I took my splits from. They came through winter, they're super strong, super populated, everybody's doing great, lots of pollen resources coming in. That's my queen stock. That's where I go from there. But we're kind of kidding ourselves as backyard beekeepers and we don't have hundreds of hives, and we don't have these mating programs, and we don't have a way of tracing the traits and making sure that we're replicating those. We're just as kind of potluck, so you're going to do the best you can for your bees, produce your queens when nutrition's are peaking, and then modern, you know, modern, pay attention to them, monitor the hives, and see what's going on. So feral stock might be able to withstand a higher mite load because feral bees, they're living in much smaller hives than we're putting together for them when they're in tree cavities and things like that. 
So that means that they're generating swarms. So they have kind of an environmental pest management going on there because they have brood cycles that are broken. They're constantly reproducing, sending out swarms that may or may not make it. And then uh, that, that causes the varroa destructor mite numbers to go down simply because there aren't resources for them to reproduce in. So I hope I answered that. Question number four, Rodney Middleton. I just pulled my Ross round supers and found them to have small hive beetles with too many hiding places. I do have multiple beetle jails in the hives. Do you have any suggestions? Thanks. So that's a, see the small hive beetle thing. And the other thing is Ross rounds because I did Ross rounds last year on several hives. Totally effective, totally worked great. I looked them over to see where all the hiding spaces are. The key to any hive configuration is making sure that your worker bees inside the hive uh, can access as much of the interior surfaces as possible to do things like control and resist the infestations by wax worms, which, you know, the wax moth has to get in there. You see them flying around at night, by the way. Kind of cool to see. They are persistent, but the bees don't tolerate them. Same thing with small hive beetles when they fly in. So there are levels of defense. We've talked about it before. Try to keep them from getting into your hive in the first place. And I understand other places are heavily loaded with small hive beetles. So population of the colony. This is kind of for everybody. So not just somebody doing Ross rounds. Populations are strong and sized right for the hive. So in other words, if you've got a whole bunch of boxes on the hive because you're planning for this huge nectar flow, but you don't have the population of bees necessary to police that interior space, then we also invite pests to move in that they can't otherwise police. Smaller hives, this is why feral colonies do so well. Again, smaller cavity, higher number of bees, better policing the area inside the hive and climate control and everything else. So then more spaces for them to hide. Beetles can come in. What's the other thing? We can block them at the entrance by modifying your entrance, but once they're in, now what are you gonna do? You're already doing it, beetle jail. So I have another question. Where is the hive situated? Because it has been statistically proven that people that put their beehives in the shade, in the woods, under trees, have a far higher incidence of small hive beetles trying to get in there than do those that are set out in the sun, in the open air, and so on. So there's multi-pronged defense and attack methods. So the trapping, uh, the Ross rounds, I don't know because I never had a small hive beetle in with any of the Ross round supers. But again, they were only put on the strongest colonies because they were the ones that of course would produce the Ross rounds, draw out the wax, fill them, cap them, and then give me those for the end of the year harvest. So I didn't put them on smaller, weaker hives and then expand boxes and have places that they can't defend against. So once they're in there, you got to do what you're already doing. Uh, trap them out. Beetle jails are good. So I'm told, see, because I'm not testing them. Get your hive entrances like this one, which somebody said queens cannot fly in and out of. So if you've got virgin queens, don't probably be putting one of those on there if that's true. And I don't know that it's true. It's just what somebody said. So keeping them from getting in. Hive gates, small entrances that stick out proud from the surface. So if this was the front of your hive, then the beetles again hit the landing board and they end up just walking around this instead of being able to go in. They need to be able to fly straight in or something. So if they land, they can't get past little lips and stuff. So small hive beetles are actually apparently kind of clumsy. Again, I'm just passing on what other people are saying. So if you've got some magical way of dealing with small hive beetles, It'd be great for you to share that right now. So high population in the hive, hive configuration, size right for that population. The fewest uh, interior surfaces and crevices and things for them to hide in. Again, I couldn't, you know, I looked over my Ross Round plastic cases that close up and I didn't really see a lot of areas that the bees could not access to control the small hive beetles. That's why the small hive beetles are pushed to the back on the bottom boards and high and back in the corners underneath the inner covers and things like that. So it's, uh, I'm, unfortunately I can't give a solid answer for that other than the things that I just mentioned, where you put your hive, how it's configured, 
population of the bees so that they can control it. Next is question number five. Chuck T. Let's see. Over the weekend, I pulled 80 pounds of honey off a hive that was getting too high to work. It's on a stand, double deep brood, and three nine frame medium supers. That is a huge hive. There were no open cells that contained nectar, and it was mostly the beautiful white capped frames. I only keep three production hives. This hive will give me at least one more medium super of honey, probably two. My question has to do with the handling of supers of harvested honey. I would like to make one mess. Who wouldn't? Who doesn't get in trouble for doing multiple harvests of honey? How long can you store pulled supers? I read numerous max storage times, and right now they're on a solid base encased in an unscented plastic lawn leaf bag that fits around the supers that is folded over the top of the supers with a hive cover on top. So... This is something that comes out, and I understand that. That colony is huge, and you've got these honey supers on, and you want to go ahead and pull that off and put it in storage and then do one big harvest at the end of the year or whatever. So this is the thing in general. And somebody's going to get mad if I mention hive butlers, but I'm going to mention them anyway. So I pull the medium supers off, and I pull the frames out, and because you can go frame by frame and just pull the fully capped frames and shake the bees off, put it in your hive butler tote, and then fill it up. It'll hold 10 of them, medium frames. And then what I like to do is, oh look, here's one right here. I take these wise dry desiccant packs, and this is a little one. Since I've started using these, I get the big ones. But what you do is, once you put the frames in your tote or whatever kind of containment system you have, what I used to do is stack the boxes with the frames in them, much as described. I took the medium super, I laid this, these giant lawn and leaf bags that I have, put the box right on it, folded it over that box, put the net box on top of that, flipped it back over and set the other box and so on. So each box was completely encased itself. And that was before I started putting in uh, Wise Dryer or any other desiccant pack that's reusable. Because uh, you don't want to waste them. Why not get a whole bunch of them and use them? Anyway, you can lay these on top of the frames, and this will take care of the condensation that's going to happen. Now, because they're not completely airtight, kind of no matter what we do. And the thing is, we get these really cold mornings, like today here. So if it drops into the 50s overnight, but this can hit the 70s or 80s, and you've got them out in a garage or some shed or something like that, the honey acts as a battery that holds that cold, and then environmental moisture condenses on it as the air around it warms up. And now we potentially have condensation problems. And then you might say, but Fred, it's got wax cappings on it and the moisture wouldn't penetrate the wax cappings. Well, there is evidence that even through the wax caps, you can actually have your honey supers taking on moisture. So that's number one is to try to, to keep it dry. Make sure it's in a dry area. And if you're fortunate and you've got a controlled environment space to keep them in with a dehumidifier and stuff like that, you're already good to go. The optimum temperature, although it's not critical, has been 51 degrees Fahrenheit for storing long term. One of the things that I worry about when it comes to stored honey in the frames is because of what I talked about already at the beginning today. We're going to have goldenrod and asters soon. And that has the potential to crystallize right in the cells. So the honey could crystallize on the frames, in the cells, and then you're not gonna be able to extract it with a centrifugal extractor. So then what you end up with is honey that potentially gets fed back to the bees at wintertime, but also that's more difficult for them to consume because now they have to use that condensed water inside the hive in wintertime to dissolve solidified honey and make it consumable for the bees. So I always like to extract as soon as possible. And that takes me on to the second part of that. If you extract the honey right away, and next thing people like to do is store it in five gallon or six gallon buckets, those white plastic food grade buckets with the honey spout on the side of it. And uh, often they leave it in that. And for a long period of time, same thing applies. Keep it dry. Keep it in a space, desiccant packs, dehumidifier, something like that. And you've got it all in the one bucket. 
and then uh, you want to make sure and get that into smaller bottles before it has a chance to crystallize because once that honey crystallizes I had a jar of that down here anyway once that honey crystallizes it's much easier to warm up and reliquify the individual jars than it is big containers because there's these big heater belts and things I happen to have one sized right for five gallon buckets and the last time it was used I loaned it to another beekeeper who had a whole bucket of solidified crystallized honey and they needed to melt it so I'm a fan of go ahead and make that mess more than once a year get it out of the frames because we're also look what's going on we're, we're still going on with the nectar flow you still want to harvest more honey get it out of those frames get it out of the cells and get those drawn frames back out there so they can fill them back up because the bees will work drawn honeycomb faster than anything else and then they'll recap it on the same hive that you took it off of because we don't want to interact with other hives and pull drawn frames off of one put them on another one and potentially spread or share pathogens that might exist in that colony as unlikely as that might be so that's my recommendation go ahead make the mess get it out of there get it in tanks and into jars and then uh, get your frames right back out there with a the pre-drawn comb so we're good to go question number six this is from good little doobie Doobie, was that romper room? Was that the doobie? So anyway, I live in northern New Jersey, and my weather seasons are very similar to yours. I run a setup similar to yours with all of my hives. I use a double deep, slatted rack, insulated top, single opening with the hive gate. Which, by the way, hive gate has just changed back to hive gate. Interesting. I've got a conundrum. I just did my checks using the soap wash method and one of my five hives with three mites. I treat my apiary as a superorganism. The whole apiary. So if I treat one, I treat all. I'm going to treat. My two options already purchased and ready to go are Formic Pro or Apigard. The temperature looks suitable for either starting midweek. I'd prefer Formic Pro given the efficacy in the brood, but the recommendation is to remove the entrance reducer. And for me, that's the hive gate. The hive gate is one of these things right here. So the gates are on to prevent robbing. I also glued the wood blocks onto the landing board because these hive gates have to be, and they have a reduced entrance that has some on there anyway do you think it's okay to just remove the plastic entrance portion and leave the metal attached if i do go with formic pro if i remove the entire setup do you think this could create an opportunity for robbing thanks again okay so here's the thing first of all hive gate h-y-f-e-g-a-t-e -E. it's on my website too we're doing an evaluation of this all the feedback has been positive no negatives so far so citizen science working so the other thing is, but I want to talk about Formic Pro because I have Formic Pro too. Formic Pro also. There's not you know, a two. So when I have Formic Pro and I listen at the bee meetings, the people that have used them in the past, some people had huge die-offs of their bees. Some people had all kinds of issues. Here's where it comes into play. Formic Pro, Formic Acid. It's organic. It's safe with your Honey Supers on and everything else. But you need to follow all of the parameters that are listed. Oh, look, you just happen to have the pamphlet. So when you get this pamphlet, read the whole thing. It even talks about how many packs to put, where to put them. And uh, efficacy has been evaluated by scientificbeekeeping.com, which is Randy Oliver's site. So if you want to read about that, pay attention to the temperature parameters of that stuff. But I have two big boxes of it on hot standby. The minute that one of my hives shows up with a treatable level of Varroa destructor mites. Well, Fred, how many mites do you let yours have? So if I had 300 bees, let's say I took this. This is my little basket. It's marked inside. There's two little level marks there. One is for 200 bees, one is for 300. 
We scoop them off of the brood frames, the ones that have open brood, because that's where the nurse bees are feeding them, and that's where the mites are going to be. And the mites are going to be looking for opportunities to get in with the open brood just before they cap them. So we want to catch those nurse bees. We want to get 300 of them in here. And once they're in here, in the bottom of this cup, we have soapy water. That's because what I like to use. Anyway, you drop this in there, do to do there's that depth of your soapy water that's in there. You put your lid on it after you pour more soapy water over the bees. And when I'm saying soapy water, because that was referenced here, what are we using? Ta-da! Dawn. Dawn Pure Essentials. How did you come up with that, Fred? Why are you using Dawn Pure Essentials? Well, first of all, when you get rid of it, it's uh, biodegradable and safe. The other thing is, again, scientificbeekeeping.com, Randy Oliver, did release agent tests, and he found out this stuff actually worked better than isopropyl alcohol for the alcohol wash. It's going to kill the bees, by the way. But guess what they found out? That when you put that in there and you dump your bees in here and you fill it up with your soapy mix, it has, uh, it's going to attack the cuticle on the bees. It's going to kill the bees. It also causes your mites to release and fall out down here. A higher release rate than other liquids that Randy Oliver tested. So, and guess what I do, by the way? Because these are plastic, right? This is yours. You can do anything you want with it. I write all my information on the lid. Of course, you put your name on it. You don't want anybody taking your stuff. But when you got your bees in here and you do that, I wrote things on here because I do a lot of teaching. So I want to share about stuff. So now once it's in here and your liquid's in here, because you can pre-mix it, how much of this Dawn Ultra dish detergent do you put in with water? Well, just so that I you know, have my brain already on here, it's 1.5 tablespoons of Ultra B per gallon of fresh water. And there's some evidence that even using distilled water might work better. But anyway, that's what you use. And then I put on here that you had a 93% release without agitation in 60 seconds. And that's according to Randy Oliver. So leave it for a couple of minutes. But when you, instead of shaking it, because what's that going to do? Suds are going to go everywhere, right? You swirl it. Randy Oliver has a little crank thing or an electric motor or something that, that agitates the stuff for him. We can just do this, just little swirls, and you can start to see it under here. And then, of course, I did another video which shows that you can have a bunch of these, especially when you're a backyard beekeeper, and you don't want to stop to do this for all of them, but you can go ahead and fill them with the wetting agent because soapy water like that, the bees will sit on, sir, if that were just water, you dump a bunch of bees in there, or you drop this in, then you drop that in, the bees would rise to the surface. But if there is soap, like in Pure Essential Dawn dish detergent there, it uh, gets the bees wet and they sink right away. And that's what you want them to do. Don't want them to suffer, you want to kill them. So that's when you're going to do your counts. But you can do this on a bunch of these plastic things. Mark each one for each hive that you're testing, because we're not Varroa counting all your hives at once. But then you can take these into your kitchen and then we pour it into a sieve, a stainless steel sieve, that catches the bee bodies, but the mites wash through. And then that gets collected onto a secondary sieve that's got a large paper coffee filter. That's where the mites end up, and they get rinsed off. Because here's the thing, too. If you don't keep them under there long enough, guess what the survival rate of the mites are? Even after the bees are dead, this is something else that Randy Oliver did. So mites that recover after two minutes of pre-soak in this stuff, let's say you rinse it off with fresh water and let them dry out, 95% of the mites could make it. Mites recover after agitation, 40%. Leave those mites in that solution for a long time to make sure that they're dead. They're not going to find their way back to the hive anyway because they'd have to climb onto bees to do it. But these are the kind of things that you can write all over your container and then get inside where your book is and where you can keep your records and everything and do that. So, but the thing is about the Formic Pro that we're going to talk about, so that's your mite counts and everybody needs to do that. You don't know your stuff is working unless you count for mites and see how many mites are left over after a treatment. 
So the other thing is for the Formic Pro, I like the longer cycle. I think it's a two 10 day period, but follow the instructions. One packet, 10 days, second packet, 10 days. So then you get it out of there. The first three days, it's super stinky. Stinky even for you. You probably can't even stand to be there. So this is where this other discussion comes in. I'm going to treat the whole apiary like a super organism. That means that when you're treating one, and I agree with this, but what if the others didn't have high mite counts? Then you keep that in your logs, and those are good stock to be working with going forward. But what happens is when you put that Formic Pro in there, and other people that are watching now that have done that, see a mass exodus of the bees from that particular colony, right? So now you can have bee drift. You can get bees that are seeking refuge in other colonies. And if they're not being treated at the same time, then they're escaping treatment. So follow all the instructions. Open the landing board completely, by the way. I would not leave that metal. The metal um, front that we're talking about that goes with those hive gates looks like this. I would definitely pull that off too. Have the full opening because the second part of the question was, won't that invite other bees to rob them while they're open? Not with that stinky Formic Pro in there, it won't. I and mean, that's just a guess. But I'm telling you, if you're a bee looking to rob something, pheromone is what attracts you there. And you're going to smell honey in a space. And you get there and you smell Formic Pro. Are you going in there to rob that place out? No. You're going to avoid it. So plus that whole apiary is just going to be a no-fly zone when you get in there with a bunch of Formic. So the other thing is temperatures, you know, below 80 or whatever the limitation is. I'm not going to look that up and quote it because if I quote here, some of you will take that information, but I, I strongly advise you to read all the instructions, limiting parameters, temperature specifically. It's the high temps that cause it to be more volatile and can actually harm your bees. So we want them to be in those control parameters. And we want to kill the Varroa destructor mites safe with, um, it works through cappings in your brood frames and also safe with your honey supers on. So non-residue treatment. So that's all good. Hive gates are working well. No issues with cooling the hives. So that's cool. And uh, Don Dish Soap, you guys, if you want a release agent, that's biodegradable so you can rinse it out later and everything and not worry. I'm on a well. I'm on a septic system. Everything I use here ends up in the environment so I'm very aware of things like that so I hope that helps with that question number seven this is Bill from Minnesota I'm interested in your opinion on how long to wait for a newly emerged queen to begin laying I don't know what the options are how long should you wait I've done some research in Bee Culture Magazine. I've found some confusing information. One of my hives, the bees waited for me to go on vacation and swarm during that time. They left behind four or five good-sized swarm cells, which from one, a queen emerged and apparently did away with the others. I located that queen on about day two after she emerged and have seen her regularly for the past 15 days. There have been no eggs laid by the queen, though, and in one article of Bee Culture, I'm not going to quote the specific article because I don't want to disagree with somebody, because um, based on this, I am going to disagree. I am going to disagree with the article. Anyway, I read that it will take at least four weeks from the time the queen emerges until she's laying. My fear was that workers might begin laying within the four weeks' time. Another bee culture article states that laying workers can be expected at about three weeks. I agree with that. So I'm going to explain some stuff. Four weeks before a queen will lay. That's a long time. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about what I observed directly. Personal experience. Videoed. Documented. Calendar marking and so on. Now, there may be instances where you don't see results from your newly installed virgin queen for 30 days out. That's when you could even start seeing adult bees, because that's kind of the, the concern, right? If we create a new queen now and we allow her to be open mated with the local drones now and she comes back mated, we're 21 days out from adult bees from that mating if she goes into lay right away. But now we've got a brand newly hatched queen. 
So the general rule, and this is bio, this is bee biology. This is not unique. So um, it takes her about nine days, nine to twelve days, to mature, to exercise, to be fed, to sexually mature, so that she can reproduce. Now, that might be concerning to some people, like described here. I mean, if she takes four weeks before she even flies, that is actually at the outside edge. So I invite you to do research on queen biology. And once a queen is hatched, what is the window of time in which she must be mated in order to be viable as a queen? I think four weeks is a really long time, but I'm not going to get directly into that, what I'm going to say is what I observe most often here. So from 9 to 13 days, that's when most of my queens make their virgin flights. So less than two weeks, that's at the 14th day, is when I start looking for eggs from that mating. And we've done that time and time again this year because I did walkaway splits and I made uh, nucleus colonies from eggs and then the queens hatched and we were seeing eggs in less than two weeks so to say absolutely that it takes four weeks before she flies out and mates maybe something's being misread maybe something's misunderstood but within two weeks we see eggs by the end of the third week we have to know the queen is there we have to know things are going on or we need to replace her with a queen which is exactly why we have these resource nucleus colonies to begin with. If I have a big colony that's gone queenless and we're without eggs for a period of up to three weeks, what's magical about three weeks? I'm going to tell you. But when we get to the third week, at the end of that third week, if there's no eggs in there, I have to install a mated queen to avoid the circumstance that we're describing right here, which is when worker bees start to lay. So some of you may be scratching your heads going, what do you mean a worker bee starts to lay? Worker bees can't lay. So here's the thing. It's the absence of a queen's pheromone. The first pheromone that she's putting out is, of course, her sex pheromone because that queen has to be attractive to drones to be mated. So that's what happens when she reaches maturity. So now we're at 9 to 13 days in there right? So she's receptive. That's when weather permitting. See, these other things can play. We can get a big storm series. We can get really cold temps and things like that, and she may not do her mating flight right away. So now she extends a couple more weeks where she might have to take advantage of an opportunity to fly to a drone congregation area to mate. So as long as the queen, so this will answer the first part of it, as long as the queen is present, her pheromone is present, this means that worker bees that may one day become laying worker bees are not stimulated to activate their ovaries. Yes, they have ovaries. They can actually become sexually mature, but here's what's going to happen to them. Have they ever flown out and been mated? No. So what they can produce are eggs, but the eggs are haploid. There's diploid and haploid. Haploid means that they're considered sterile. They're only going to produce drones. That's why only drones are present in a hive that's in profound decline in the absence of a queen and laying workers are the only things present. That's why these laying workers whose ovaries have been activated by the absence of the queen's pheromone and how long does it take for those ovaries to get activated and become productive? Ta-da! Three weeks, 21 days. So, but that means they had to be 21 days without a queen. So we've got a queen here. This queen is still moping around. Maybe weak pheromones and maybe not the queen mandibular pheromone of a mated queen that lets them know a mated queen is a stronger pheromone that causes everybody to be calm. Because you can go into a noisy hive that's queenless. They're all humming and they're reacting to everything that's going on around them. And you put in a mated queen, assuming there are no laying workers yet. This is why you have to be active in observing your hives and knowing what's going on in them because you don't want to have three weeks without a queen. And then you have the laying workers. Now we have a problemed hive. It's very difficult to turn around, but you drop that new queen in there and they've been without one and they're all noisy and they get really calm and really quiet and they start attending to the queen. All things are queen right. And that's what that term queen right means. You've got a mated queen. She's in there. Everything's good. The colony is calm. So I think you're okay. 
because that queen is still roaming around. Now you need to pay attention because if she never does fly out and do her mating and there aren't drones and she doesn't get you know, the proper level of fertility, you can actually end up with a queen whose ovaries get activated and she starts laying, which is what you call a drone laying queen in the absence of proper fertilization, proper mating, then uh, she starts to produce eggs still, and now those are what? Haploid or diploid? Those are haploid. If she's not mated, she just lays eggs that are shooting blanks, as they say, which are just the males, which is insulting to them. But so I think you're okay. Watch that queen. And three weeks is magic. Four weeks for a queen to mature and mate. I don't know where that comes from, so I just have to guess that maybe something's been misread. Or there's some misunderstanding there. Next is question number eight. George Garcia. I know you haven't had mite problems this year, but I wanted to share with you my experience treating a long hive that is similar to yours in the inside for mites using Formic Pro. So we're back on Formic Pro again. I have it. I haven't used it. I haven't had to. The bee shifted the brood next towards the opposite side of the long hive, away from the entrance and the Formic Pro pads. So this Formic Pro, these little pads get opened up from their cellophane foil or their aluminized foil, and they get placed in there. I didn't remove the pads after 20 days. So that's the double series. One pad, 10 days. Second pad, 10 days. You're supposed to remove the first pad when you put the second pad on, on top of the backs of the frames that have the brood. So, which was a big mistake as the bees refused to move the brood area back towards until the pads were removed because of residual smell. If your long hive does get varroa and you have to treat, I'm curious as to how you will do so. Well, I have to cross that bridge when it gets there, but this is a testament. This stuff, Formic Pro, Formic Acid is stinky stuff. If you've never done it, when you open it, it's going to stink to the high heavens. If you put that in there on top of the frames and it's treating, the strongest smell is the first three days, but you've got a period of 10 days that you have to do it. When you're going to overlap with the second treatment, pull the other one out. At the end of those 10 days, pull it all out of there. Don't leave it behind. I know some people just leave it there. Please don't. And maybe it can impact the behavior as described here and have your bees avoid that area and uh, not want to do their brood and everything. Temperature parameters, proper placement, removing at the end of the treatment cycle. That's what I recommend. Follow all instructions. Okay, so what will I do if my horizontal hive lets me down and they start to have varroa destructor mites above my treatment levels, which would be out of 300 bees, would I get seven or more varroa destructor mites in my count? So depending on the time of year, if it's in a brood, low brood area, high dearth period, I would be inclined to use uh, oxalic acid vaporization because it's really just perfect for the horizontal hive format. Goes everywhere, gets on everything. And of course you have to do several cycles. That's why I use the ProVape 110. And uh, that lets me do several cycles down the line. And uh, now in a lot of areas, it is approved for use with your Honey Supers on. But with my Long Langstroth hive, I don't care about the honey supers because I'm not harvesting honey from it. I'm just using that as an observation, kind of a research thing, and a training hive. So if somebody's learning about bees, I go into the Long Langstroth hive, and because we're not lifting boxes and everything, we're just going frame by frame to show the progression and to show where they store what and that they organize their resources. And then we're going to look at, as we did recently, all of the eggs, all of the brood, find the queen, mark the queen with that little white dot, and then release her so we get to show all kinds of cool stuff and that is the perfect hive design to do exactly that if you're teaching people about bees horizontal hives are the heat in the kitchen so anyway but a cautionary tale about formic pro use it correctly what will i use if i get it i mean i have formic pro here so it's approved i'm inclined to probably use it if i have a real mite bomb in my apiary which nobody's done that so far there's one Flowhive 2 Plus colony that I started this year. They had three Varroa destructor mites in them. But you have to be aware, because right now, we're at a time of increase where I live, and what increases with the brood, 
mite counts. I think we really got a solid handle on the mites last winter. I think I just have to guess that that's what happened. Because we have brought no new stock in except that one Saskatchewan. Everything else was a winter survival stock right here, so I don't know what's going on. Mite numbers and counts continue to be low, but I'm not backing off on my vigilance when it comes to that. Next question is from Brad Oliphant. Question number nine. After watching a lot of YouTube videos lately, I see almost everyone is in a dearth. But I don't seem to be and have a question for you. I was in my hive yesterday, July 23rd, and there was so much capped brood workers and drone and an abundance of drone bees. Also, they're still bringing in pollen that I can see and I think nectar, which I can't see. And I spotted the queen and she is still laying eggs. I'm also not feeding my bees right now. Good idea. Let them get the stuff for the environment. I do see robber activity in the back of my hive and under the hive and a few yellow jackets. So why are my bees not slowing down? I do want to address the description of robbing activity. So for those who might be new to beekeeping, what is the difference between the resident bees when they're coming and going from that landing board and that main entrance and those that are looking to rob? And we know that the wasps aren't there for a social call. They're there to look for resources that they can exploit. So just as Brad describes here, uh, robbers come in at the sides, underneath, they check the back, they're always checking underneath the hive cover and they're looking for cracks and openings. So they're backdoor people, right? Backdoor bees, backdoor wasps. So they're looking for the little skirting ways, little creepy, sneaky ways to get in and steal stuff. So that's the behavior you're looking for when there's robbers. They're all over the place, they're trying to avoid going in and engaging the guards of the hive. But the other thing is, I don't see a problem with anything that's going on here. The one question I do have is, he says that we don't see um, the nectar coming in. We don't generally see that, but the bees would be coming in and they would be fortified. So we'll go back to something I said earlier, which is when you're looking at your open larvae, look to see how much of uh, the resources, how much royal jelly and everything is being put in there with those newly hatched larvae. The minute that egg hatches, a nurse bee would be right in there creating a tiny pool of nutritional resources for the development of that larvae. So, larva individual. Anyway, so we wanna look for that soup and how much of those resources are in there. And if it's there, this creamy, translucent white substance that they're in, then they're sitting fat. I see nothing to worry about for that. So in fact, and we're here where I live, this minor dearth that we had is at its end. It's coming up. Even the cosmos, I'm very happy to say, had honeybees on them. So apparently I got the right line of cosmos flowers and I planted thousands of them. So I really gambled this year and it's going to turn out to be a good thing because lots of native pollinators are on it. Lots of pollen glistening with nectar. All the bees will start working it as the numbers of blossoms increase. So I don't see a problem with it. Bees are telling me they sell plenty of resources. They sure are. Paul and everything else, not everybody goes into a dearth. So I think Brad is good to go. Next question, number 10. Vallas, V-A-L-A-S. I used better comb on my hives and they chewed it down to the wire that was embedded. Well, they build it back out they haven't built it out yet, and it's been a couple of months now. So, better comb. I do want to comment on that because, oh man, here's better comb. This is a frame of better comb. So what is it? It is synthetic beeswax. Some people like it, some people don't. But if you're putting in a brand new swarm or something like that, and this particular frame, uh, when you're starting off a colony and they need resources, they need to go to work right away. This is stuff that kicks them off. The first year I used it, incredible. The reason I have this one here, and I hope it shows up on the camera, because this one's done wrong. That's right. So I did get a couple of questions about better comb. This is wire reinforced. See the little wires there? And I did come across this uh, when I was looking at some other hives. I noticed that not only was the better comb being chewed away, but they exposed like a whole third of it over here and the wires were just here by themselves. So this is uh, high tensile carbon steel wire that is nickel plated. This is from Better B. 
So, but I realized looking closely at each of these frames, what's different about the ones where the bees are working around it and excavating away the cells even and exposing the wire instead of just going ahead and building the wax up. Well, when you look at this side of it, do you see the wires through the comb? You really don't on that side. And then look at this side. I hope it shows up. See the wires? See how visible they are going through there? What did I do wrong? I didn't embed the wires far enough. So in other words, when you look at better comb, it has the foundation. And then of course the cells are drawn off of the foundation. That center thicker foundation piece is when you're melting the comb through the cells and the comb. When you're melting the wire into the better comb, make sure it embeds all the way into that. You've got the cells coming together like this and then this piece is through the middle. That wire needs to embed into that thick foundation piece of the synthetic wax. If it does not fully embed in that and is still out just a little bit in the little cells, it holds the comb in place, but the bees won't work it. In fact, they'll start chewing out around it. So that was the consistent problem I noticed where I did find places where the bees were not using the better comb. In fact, were removing it around the wires is because the wire did not embed all the way into that center bottom piece. So when you're using your electrodes and your 12 volt battery or whatever you're using to embed that system, make sure that those wires go all the way into that foundation in the middle and that the cells are complete without the wire going out partially into the cells on either side or the bees will clear out around it. The other thing I noticed, and this answers the other part of the question, will they come back later and build the comb around the wires? They did, because I had that situation in the horizontal hive at the beginning of the year, and they did come back. They left a big gap, and the last time I did an inspection, it was all, all the comb was complete now. So what they did is they built out their comb, but again, they aligned it so that the wires were in the center. So if they were a little off to one side, then the, the center of the foundation of the new wax they were building came from the wires in the middle and then out on both sides. So then they altered the alignment of the cells that they made themselves. So because some people use wired frames, even when the bees build the foundation themselves, or they put regular bees wax foundation in there on wired frames. So when you're dealing with just a piece of wax foundation, then you know you're embedding it right onto the wires and then the bees are gonna draw that out. But in this case, we're dealing with pre-drawn cells and everything else, and then that gets embedded onto the wires. Now we have to be much more careful about making sure that embeds all the way in. Another question that said here is they haven't built out yet and uh, is it too late to request a hive? So I'm not sure I completely understand that question but it is late in the year to be starting with a brand new hive unless it would be a complete nucleus colony and you were going to keep it small you know because a nucleus colony has the queen, she's in lay, we have all stages of brood, we already have a workforce and generally have five frames ready to go. So if you put that in an eight or 10 frame box, you still might have time where I live for them to build out and get their resources ready for winter. Next question comes from Barris. It's question number 11. I have a question. If anyone knows the answer, please let me know. I have seen hornet attacks on beehives and 20 to 30,000 bees massacred in hours. Why do the bees not leave the hive with the queen and start somewhere else? Instead, they choose to defend the hive until they die. Well, first of all, I wish, Barris, if you're watching, that you told us where you're living. What part of the country is this in the United States? Is it somewhere else? New Zealand, Australia? Um, because this falls right into play with areas 20 to 30,000 bees massacred in hours. That's enormous, and I've never heard of that. Um, here. But to answer the question, why don't the bees just depart and go somewhere else? First of all, the queen that's in lay, she can't fly out. This is why <clears throat> it's flawed thinking when some people say that uh, we smoke the bees because there's going to be a forest fire and then they think there's a forest fire. Therefore, they take up a bunch of stores because they're making preparations to leave the hive and go start a new home somewhere else. 
Well, there's no way they can really do that. They would be absolutely doomed if a fire showed up and they took on a bunch of resources and flew out because the queen would be left behind, the queen would die, and therefore the colony without the queen cannot survive. They can't make a new queen. They're not grabbing eggs and taking them with them in a fire. Same thing when they're under attack by these hornets or wasps. Um, 20 to 30,000 bees are dying. They can't just fly out and go somewhere else and take the queen with them. Again, they'd leave her behind and they would certainly perish. That's why the bees are there defending their colony to the last bee. And this is why, and somebody's going to get mad and think that, hey, Fred, you're just trying to sell this, those, uh, you know, BIQ solutions, hive gate entrances. Well, I want to talk about it again because the guy that invented these did so because colonies were being wiped out by wasps in a part of the world where the wasps are much more prevalent and much more aggressive towards the honeybees to the point of wiping out entire colonies of bees, which is exactly what's being described here. So for Barris, please look into BIQ Solutions. Look into these entrances because this was designed so a small colony of bees could defend themselves successfully against being attacked by wasps. The Asian giant hornet, you get this question a lot, will the Asian giant hornet be able to get in there? No, it can't. So they can defend themselves because it can't gain access to a colony that has this as its entrance. Too big, too large. Even the European hornets, which I've never seen mob a hive, but if they wanted to, even the European hornet can't fit through this opening. So it provides a long conduit to defend them. Please, you can see this at thewaytobe.org. There's a whole page on it. The company has a new website. I have their new link on there. And we have a Hivegate Citizen Science Group page on Facebook. A lot of people aren't on Facebook, so they can't join the group. But um, all of the feedback that I've received on this, because I'm waiting here in the United States, because we just started evaluating these this year. But the desert not the desert, but the northwestern United States, Washington State in particular, a lot of beekeepers said that they have high pressure from wasps there and they lose lots of hives. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from those people at the end of the year and see how they worked to help the bees defend themselves against this seasonal, predictable attack by wasps every year. So it sounds like Barris would benefit from that. Absolutely, get hive gates, put them on there too late for that colony but that's why they can't fly out. They'd fly out, leave the queen behind, and they all die. Next question, number 12. Be kind to be free. Uh, here we go. Uh, waiting for a run of three cooler days to start treating with Formic Pro once the honey is off. So Formic Pro, again, a lot of people are treating with that. I think it's a good choice. Uh, my alcohol wash counts are borderline at six and seven on two of my eight hives. The rest are one or none. The instructions say to add an empty super for escape space. So yes, always follow the instructions. So anyway, for an escape space, would this be with frames or not? You want to have frames in there. If you're putting on the extra body, you want frames in it so the bees don't have to just mob and cluster in the corner or hang suspended on the inner cover, that kind of thing. You want to have the frames in there so the bees have something to cluster on, spread out more surface area and all that stuff. So I guess in the former, we did not know. My experience last year, they propolized adjacent stuff. So that's it. Yeah, just the extra box as they tell you to do. Make sure there's frames in it for them to cling to. Here we are with the last question already. So this is from Todd. Fred, how many cells are on your favorite acorn frames and does it really matter? And that was my opening thing. And here's the funny part of that. Does it matter how many cells are on the frames inside your hives? Well, through the years, I've been keeping bees since 2007. And uh, one of the first things I jumped on was Pureco plastic frames because everything I read about it, they hold up longer, wax moths can't chew through them. And uh, they talk about, you know, being pre-waxed and the whole nine yards, which so just seemed good to me. So I got Pureco frames in the beginning and they worked really well. And then years later, I noticed that my Pureco frames, by the way, sometimes flexed through the middle. They deformed a little bit. So in the field, especially on the deep frames. 
So one of the guys that used to work at Pierco actually branched off on his own, came up with an improved design for the Pierco frames, materially, design-wise, and he developed a company called Acorn Frame. So the reason this comes up is because every plastic frame company that, that we're, let's say the top five, I got all their frames, I put all their frames together. Uh, we checkerboard them through hives to see which ones get drawn out, worked first by the bees and everything else. Long story short, I arrived at the Acorn Heavy Wax Frames as the one most quickly used by the bees. So then I wrote to him because I got this question, how many cells are on your favorite Acorn Frames? So I actually wrote to Acorn and I said, hey, how many cells are on the frames of your deep frame here? So he wrote back and said he's never counted them, which is interesting to me. You make something and you don't count them. So what did that leave me with? I had to count them. So I started with this top row right here and I counted all the cells across the top. How many cells are embossed on this frame across that row? 82 cells. Then we have to go down this way. And how many rows are there? So we go all the way down, count each row all the way to the bottom, and there's 47 full rows of cells embossed on the surface of this. So then you multiply that together. How many cells would you have? 82 times 47, 3,854 cells on that side. So 7,708 total frame, both sides. So then, so now we have that spec right so this is a favorite frame that my bees use and when it comes to the installed the inserted frames that you put the foundation from acorn that goes into a wooden frame you would have fewer cells than you have on the one piece because it goes edge to edge all the way around the interior does it matter does it really matter how many cells are on that frame well, what really matters is the bees are going to build the cells. Are they the right size for the bees to be developing their larvae in? Sure, it's proven. It works. They do it all the time, they wall to wall. They don't like mushroom them out, you know. There's, they're not channeled. So when they come off the cells, they're the same uh, distance through the length of the cell. So does it matter how many cells are on that frame? Um, not really, I would think, because once they develop it out, if they run out of space, what are they going to do? They're going to move to the frame adjacent to that. And then if they run out of space there, they're going to move to that frame adjacent. So once they start to fill up these cells and they're developing brood, because that's the critical part, the other part of that is those are the deep frames. It's rare to use those for honey production, but you can. So then the number of cells, does that affect honey production? No, not really. In fact, for honey production, you would want fewer cells, not more cells. Why? Because fewer cells, fewer cell walls, less honey gets used to make the cells, to make the comb that draws out on it. And they're only using it for nectar, for honey, just like let's consider the Flow Hive, Flow Supers, those frames over here. Those frames are deeper than normal cells. And the cell size is between the size of a worker and a drone. So it's actually six millimeters, 6.5 millimeters, somewhere around there for the interior dimension of the cells because they only want that for honey production. So fewer cells, more honey, more cells, the thinking is more brood. But my practical observation to that is if they need more brood, they'll occupy more space with the brood. They'll move up into the next box. They'll move to the cells and the frames adjacent to it. So concentrating more brood in a smaller space, is that some big advantage or not? You know, I don't know. I don't think so. But to answer the question, at least, I had to spend my time counting the cells. So that's the answer to how many cells are on it. Does it matter? I don't think so. Because the bees are going to expand and use more space as they need it. Are they going to run out of space? No, because that's the beauty of the Langstroth box. If they're running out of space, if they're full, we add another box, more frames, more space for them to have brood, store pollen, store nectar, and to occupy the box, to occupy the hive. So it's infinitely expandable. And then, of course, we contract it back down to match the population as the population decreases. What about that horizontal hive configuration? Same thing. 
if they're filling the frames out that they have and the resources are exceeding the space they have to store it, we add more frames. Because my long length drop box is five feet long. So I don't anticipate it going beyond that. All deeps, by the way. So 20 through the year, if they were making everything new themselves, but by providing a foundation, it's just an imprint for the bees to start to build off of. What's critical for that is the amount of wax that's on it. Some people wax their own. I've been using the Acorn heavy wax frames, the way they come from the company, and the bees draw those out right away, work them right away, and so they're great. Does it really matter? Not in my opinion. Maybe somebody else knows something more about that. But uh, I arrived at the acorn frames because they were rigid, they were strong, the bees work them, they don't flex the way the early Pirco frames, Pirco still, I'm still not sure they still make them. Other frames I found were too brittle and sometimes lightweight and uh, actually the ears broke and things like that. So I've landed on the sweet spot right there. But that's it. Thank you for making me count cells just so that we could get that number out there. Anyway, uh, join us on Facebook. And if you don't, also you can listen to this on, on a podcast through Podbean. It's called The Way to Be. So you can listen that way while you go about your work. And uh, that's it. Get ready if you're in the northeastern United States. With all the rain that we've had through the year, it looks like Goldenrod is going to open early. Pay attention to the environment. Get your coffee cup, whatever you drink, tea, whatever, and take a nature hike. See what's blooming. See how much of it there is. And see the increase of the bees coming in when those pollen and nectar resources start to bloom. You have to be ready because the bees are going to occupy twice the cells when they spread their fresh nectar out. And they're going to be dehydrating it because bees are smart. They understand more surface area, easier to dehydrate. And then over the night, they can dense it and consolidate those resources into fewer cells as it becomes more concentrated with sugar and the water gets evaporated off. So they have to have the space to do that. And your job as a beekeeper is to give them the boxes in your infinitely expandable Langstroth hive design, probably. Uh, stay ahead of your bees. Be ready. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again.